It's the final chapter of our 1813 campaign. Today, we determine the fate of Central Europe and more importantly, my empire. In part one, you saw us refight the spring campaign with the French winning a narrow advantage. In part two, I negotiated with the Russian Tsar during our summer armistice. To be honest, I really didn't care about the outcome of the negotiation with the Tsar. For us, it was all smoke and mirrors. We have our plan, and it's a bold one. In our previous video, you saw the commanders on both sides debate strategies for the fall. My marshals and I have chosen a risky, completely ahistorical plan to strike deep into Austria to try and knock out the Austrians out of the coalition before the rest of the Allies can unite against us. And it might just lead to a tabletop battle even bigger than Leipzig was. The fall campaign for the liberation of Germany begins now on Little Wars TV. Today's final chapter in our 1813 trilogy is an absolute monster of an episode, packed with wargaming action. Before we jump into it, we wanted to let you know that we are running another free giveaway at the end of the episode. We're giving you one more copy of Campaign of Nations, the board game that we used throughout the series. And we're also giving away two army packs of the brand new 10mm figure range released by the wargaming company. Dave and Becky are friends of the channel and kindly reached out to offer our viewers a French army box and a Russian army box absolutely free. And you could win them today, shipped right to your front door. Learn how to win later in the video. Today is the final phase of the campaign, picking up where the historical nine-week summer truce ended in mid-August 1813. Two days after hostilities resumed, Austria broke its alliance with France and joined the coalition. But as you know, that was never a preordained outcome in our war game. In fact, as a result of the summer truce talks between Miles and the gallant Tsar, wow, that guy looks good in uniform, right? Two expert Napoleonic historians agreed that French success in our spring campaign should give Napoleon the opportunity to spend victory points as a way to buy Austrian support and delay their entry into the war. Miles did seem to toy with this option, but ultimately he decided to keep his victory points and not bow to pricey Austrian demands. In fact, in part two of our series, you heard the French strategy for the fall. Today, they will attempt a completely ahistorical plan, striking with their full force against Prague, where Schwarzenberg and Barclay de Tolly have nearly a quarter million troops under arms. Will this crazy plan succeed? I can assure you that it is the last move our allied players are expecting. During our strategy conference, we broadly agreed the French would indeed strike hard and fast, but to the north or maybe the east, certainly not south through the mountains. And when surveyed during the summer talks, 92% of our patrons agreed Napoleon would be crazy to march into Austrian territory. If you want to hear the full strategy conferences for each side, go back and watch part two of this series, because right now we're hurtling directly into the fall campaign to find out how this is going to unfold. Let's start with army deployments. The Allies are required to deploy in three separate regions, as they were historically divided. Because Ed is fully expecting trouble in the north, he leaves only a token garrison at Hamburg, and husbands the bulk of Bernadotte's army of the north, far northeast of Berlin. Chow has similar concerns, fearing that he could be the isolated target of Napoleon's wrath choosing to keep the army of Silesia hunkered down around Breslau. In both cases, these allied armies are trying to put some distance between themselves and Napoleon, under the assumption that when Napoleon lashes out, they'll have the space to move toward each other to reinforce, while Tony and Dieter fall on the French rear. An excellent plan, on paper. But the allies have no idea. Their deployment has played perfectly into French hands. As deployed now, 
Chow and Ed are much farther from Prague than the French, and those pesky French fortresses of Glogau and Kustren are blocking key roads. Here is the full French deployment. Well, at least, as the Allies see it on the tabletop. Remember, we've modified Campaign of Nations as a board game to use flags as blinds, so our players around the table have no idea what each flag represents. Is it 10,000 men or is it 100,000? And this fog of war is about to smack the Allies in the face with devastating results. Because as the Allied players see these flags, French intentions are far from clear. Are they merely screening the mountain passes? Why are there so many flags around Berlin? Could this be Napoleon's main force, as expected? Allow me to clarify the situation for your entertainment. Here is what the French flags actually represent. In the north, Eugene's command is spread paper thin to try and fool the Allies into believing this could be a larger concentration. It's in the south where Napoleon, Ney, and Marat have massed over 300,000 troops for their hammer blow. The Austrians are about to receive a very rude welcome to the War of the Sixth Coalition. I think we're going to fight a delaying action. Right here. Right now. A line must be drawn. No bother. <laughs> Excellent. I have a feeling you're not actually going to delay him. <laughs> that, that would be my guess. What do you got there, Tony? Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dark Napoleon. Actually, it looks like Napoleon's taking the uh, the ring of power to. Uh, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's gangster Napoleon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you got there, Tony? I have a force of twenty six thousand. Twenty six thousand men. I have a force of ten thousand. A hundred thousand. Excuse me. <laughs> Which is it, Miles? <laughs> it's a one and five zeros. Ah! To resolve a battle using the board game rules, one player rolls on this table. The odds for the French are in the four to one column. Roll up. Yes. Ah, four. Four. Four is not good. Four is defender is disrupted. So you must retreat, and we, get, we need to get a disruption marker that will place on all the units that make your guys. You retreat any hex that's not in a French zone of control. And that's the first French field victory. Wow. Oh, yes. Move the French. It was the, uh, it was the whole hood thing. That's what, that's what did it, the martial hood. Though his advance pickets have been driven in, Tony's brief stand in the mountains yields valuable and shocking intel about French intentions. Such a strong French concentration in the south leaves the Allies in stunned disbelief, and also leaves them in urgent need of a new campaign strategy. I mean, I guess if he's going hard for Prague, what's the move here? I mean, I mean well, that's a big feint. <sighs> How many trips do you have in Prague? A third of your forces. I have 100,000 in Prague, plus yeah. Dieter has, however but many. You kind of need mass to We have a huge troops. Do you know how, many, yeah. how many troops do you have in Prague? And Prague's a fortress. Yes. See here yeah. is an eight stack. Well, do you want to attack? Mm -hmm. What if you guys converge on it? I, I'm thinking that is. Uh, yeah. 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 This flag mm -hmm. is eighty thousand. Yeah. Then yeah. You, you guys come in here from two directions and absolutely know, mess them up. Just remember that coordination is difficult. Yeah. There and is a gap here, so he can't call on these for help, right? No. Mm -hmm. The problem. The problem is these three. These four? I don't know what these are. I know. Could be nothing. Get Could your be. licks in while you can. Yeah. Tony and Dieter are in an aggressive mood. With unknown French flag markers streaming through multiple mountain passes, they see an opportunity to attack Napoleon's vanguard before these mysterious French columns can unite. On the Allied half of turn one, Schwarzenberg attacks, and de Tolly force pushes 40,000 men to support him. Miles is taken aback by the counterattack, and he orders a retreat north toward the mountains. Outside of Bohemia, Ed and Chow cautiously advance their armies, still a bit uncertain as to the exact French dispositions. 
going into turn two, Napoleon and his marshals are staring down the barrel of what could be their worst case scenario. Their main force is divided, and hopes for a lightning passage through the mountain gaps have been dashed by a bold allied counterthrust. There is some talk of pulling back to regroup near Dresden, but Miles squashes this talk of retreat. He is all in on the southern strategy come hell or high water. With a sizable Russo-Austrian army blocking the main road to Prague, Simon is ordered to force march his men to unhinge Schwarzenberg's position and relieve pressure on Napoleon's main column. Forced marches are a critical part of the board game, and I really like the way Campaign of Nations handles this in a quick, clean manner. Simon must first declare the number of spaces he's attempting to march beyond his normal movement allowance. You can risk up to three more hexes. If you roll high and the result has an A next to it, you suffer attrition, and you lose 10,000 men. On turn two, Simon pushes Ney's core for the maximum three hex force march, and he rolls a five. Ney's third core gets just two extra hexes, and at the steep cost of 10,000 men. It's a price the Emperor is more than willing to pay, and with Ney now in position on the flank, Napoleon attacks the Austrians again. So 190 to 310 French? Looks like a uh, one to one. Something along the lines of fifty to a hundred thousand men. Yes. But go ahead. It took a second. To Merd. The Thunder retreats. Napoleon's lucky hoodie does the trick, and the battle forces Tony to pull back closer to Prague with minor losses for both sides. During the Allied turn, the Army of Bohemia concentrates northwest of Prague, while the other coalition armies advance at a more rapid pace, increasingly convinced they are not facing major French resistance. And indeed, they are correct. French strength is massed in Bohemia. And on turn three, it finally clears the mountain passes and begins to concentrate for a decisive battle yet to come. Napoleon and his marshals expect that they will be the ones to strike the blow on their next turn. They have no idea that Tony and Dieter are considering a preemptive action to seize the initiative and attack. This is a bold and potentially suicidal move given the forces arrayed northwest of Prague. By now the Allies know that they are likely outnumbered, but not by exactly how much. In our board game, remember that units in adjacent hexes do still have to make a die roll to successfully concentrate for attack or defense. So while Napoleon's army is massing, a poor die roll could catch the French by surprise. It's an exceptionally dangerous gambit, and the turn three debate among the coalition players is um, animated. I'll use the word animated because uh, there's so much swearing in this conversation, we'd have to bleep most of it out for YouTube. Well, gentlemen, we are a mere week into the fall campaign. We had a little bit of a, well, actually, a quite, a quite lengthy chat with all of the coalition players. And, and uh, I have to say, the final decision was left up to... Tony and Dieter, because they're the two who are there. You know, we're we're whatever, hundreds of miles away, presumably from this battle. I I was in favor of a very different strategy. Uh, I was in favor of a withdrawal, slow withdrawal from Prague and the mountains, so that we could try to maybe unite all of our elements, or at least unite with you, Chow, and try to even up the numbers around Dresden. But you know, I, I understand that Tony and Dieter felt like you know contact is very tight. It is difficult. It's always difficult to withdraw in the face mm -hmm. of an enemy, even in a board game. Uh, and, you know, they felt that Napoleon's right on top of them. And we are at a numerical disadvantage, but not so much so that it's an absurd battle. No, no. Uh, but, I mean, Napoleon has not quite 50% uh, mass advantage. Um, quality of troops is is at this point I'm not totally sure because some of the French troops are not good. Right, he has the guard. 
obviously. But yeah. the Russians have their guard. And the Russian have their guard. Dieter has the guard. Prussian, Prussian guard are there as well. Right. Um, although I, I do tend to agree with you in, in that um, not heated, but that lengthy conversation that we had, that it, it felt to me that um, we might have been better off not engaging um, because we are going to be engaged against our will anyway. Um, but, you know, so it's not a foregone conclusion. Nevertheless, but... the cost of victory just went up. It's going to cost the British government a lot more money. <laughs> You're yeah. always thinking about the British, <laughs> aren't you, Ed? Well, somebody's going to have to pull this out, and it ain't <laughs> us. Yeah, no. Dun um, Dunkirk before there was Dunkirk. <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember. Does the Danube go close to Prague? Because I think that's the only way they're going to get there. We're hopping on. <laughs> I can't remember. Don't hate I me for my do lack of geography. I what's best for Sweden, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're close to the coast, Ed. You'll be fine. <laughs> I know. I'm hoping. That, yeah. <laughs> He's already planning his withdrawal. I like to put my feet up, though, so... So, Carl, you might not be ready for this. We actually care about film inequality, so that's why we've been moving around all the time. So it's going to be a little different for you. The production values are, are different, too. I mean, Greg's dressed like Muammar Gaddafi. Like, there's just... There's a yeah, lot he, of... He does that all the time. We actually don't talk about it. Just trust me. All right. Well, generals, we have gotten the battle we want. We have lured the Allies into attacking us. We outnumbered them pretty significantly. What do you think our plan should be? Uh, well, given the rule set that we're playing, I would say to defend and let them come to us. I believe that's the case. We have a pretty heavy cavalry force with Ney on the right flank that I think we should use to smash them at the right time. I think we should hold it in reserve to let them advance to us. I do want to advance a bit to take those hills and get that advantage for uh, melee combat. We're going to need every advantage we can get against those Russians. I have positioned the Imperial Guard behind the flank the Russians are on. Gentlemen, the fate of France rests upon this battle. We've achieved what we want, now we have to deliver. And given the size of the battle, I think we'll be here a while. Uh, we will be here a while. Let's make sure we all take potty breaks. So the decision has been made, and the die is cast. Schwarzenberg and Tully roll to concentrate and attack Napoleon in a truly titanic clash. It's 300,000 French versus 190,000 Allied troops. Here are the available forces for the upcoming battle. Note that both the French and Russian Imperial Guard are present. To fight this battle on the tabletop with miniatures, we set up a six foot by eight foot board. We use styrofoam hills underneath a felt round map. Guys then add some felt roads, caulk rivers, fields made of various fabrics, tree clumps, and six millimeter buildings. Our buildings are from Total Battle Miniatures. Shout out to the guys at Total Battle. They are not a sponsor of this video, but they make some really nice buildings, and we're fans. This is not a historical battle, or even a specific battlefield. Our players set this table up based on mutual agreement. It's a fairly open area, as most Napoleonic battlefields would have been, with a main road from Prague running up the center of the table. We spent about 20 minutes sorting out the unit bases to assemble our 15 millimeter armies. Remember, in our campaign, a base of figures represents an entire division. These are massive armies by Napoleonic standards. We're about to fight a battle comparable in size, roughly half a million men, to Leipzig itself. Using the rules volley and bayonet, upscaled to the division level, it's entirely possible to resolve a battle of this size in a single afternoon. And that's why our club really likes this rule set for big, fast-playing Napoleonic battles. Even though it was written about 30 years ago, the rules hold up very well today. In fact, we just interviewed one of the original authors, Frank Chadwick, and his interview will be available on Little Wars FM sometime next month. If you're a Patreon supporter, you can actually go and get an early listen to that podcast now. But right now in our video, it's time for the epic showdown. And it will include Napoleon's entire force in Bohemia, because the French role for concentration is a success. Failure to concentrate was always a long shot, but it's a long shot Tony and Dieter were counting on. Now, on the eve of battle, Schwarzenberg and de Tully are increasingly anxious about their fateful decision. All right, the question, in all honesty, the question is, do we just turn one, turn around and walk off the table? If we can cover our retreat with our force, which we won't need once we're holed up, 
If we look at the French deployment as it is now, they are coming hard on the Russians. They have two cavalry corps and the Imperial Guard over there. They're gonna come hard at the Russians. I think probably the thing to do is for all the Austrians, including the units I have in reserve, to just bonsai that and just try and just try and wreck as much of that as we can. So should I push up or should I wait? I mean, I've got to at least move up to prevent you from getting flanked as you... Right, right, right. Do I attack an echelon or...? I would suggest that um, the movement's going to be dictated by them because they're actually going to attack us. There's no way they're not going to attack us. I mean, of course I'm going to say that one stupid, but... Um, with, with, yeah, with, with none of us thought they were going to attack Austria, so at this point... Yeah. I don't think any of us have a clue, but go ahead. <laughs> the Allied plan taking shape on the eve of battle is to hold on the Russian flank and focus a narrow avenue of ferocious attack for the Austrians, screened by the mountains and a stream on one flank and friendly Russian troops on the other, Tony will punch a hole through the French line and inflict as many casualties as possible before nightfall allows the Allies to retreat back to Prague. With any luck, Napoleon could find himself with a very bloody nose and little to show for it. In a big campaign battle like this one, we always allow all of our players to participate in tabletop action. So while Dave, Ed, and Chow have no troops present at this engagement, everyone still gets to play in the game. And as you can see, there are plenty of troops to command in the Battle of Prague. It opens with a general Austrian advance and a covering advance by the Russian Imperial Guard in the center. Dieter assembles a formidable grand battery of Russian guns in the center to deter any adventurous French advances. Movement rates in Bali and Bayonet are big, so it doesn't take long for Tony to close with the French left, commanded by Carl. Yes, you got it. You got to die. Right, so, so I'm a penalty because I'm yep. disorder. Yep. So, minus one. So mine. Uh... <laughs> Can I sit on four? <laughs> Two hits, Tony. Nada. The French get the better of the first wave, holding steady with heavy losses on both sides. Tony is undeterred and pushes onward with his second wave. No, because we're gonna win here. <laughs> spirit. That's yeah. spirit time. That's a spirit. Lichtenstein. <laughs> Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein. Four dice. Ooh, nice. Ooh. One, two, three, four, five, six, one hit. One hit. Hey. One hit. One to one, everybody loses a box. Yes. And what is our morale? Our morale is six. Four. Ooh, Ooh our morale is four. Ooh, plus two. You can Carl. Do it. A four. It's doable. No. <clears throat> Tony lost the tiebreaker in that particular combat. In Volley and Bayonet, the attacker and defender each roll a handful of six sided dice, looking for sixes to hit. In the case of a tie, like Tony and Carl just had, both units will then roll one die and add their morale score. The high roll wins the combat. It's quick, it's simple, and it definitely emphasizes the importance of morale in this era of warfare. With Tony now trying to regroup for a third wave, Napoleon's marshals urge their emperor to approve a general counterattack across the line. Simon is especially eager to unleash his wing against the utterly passive Russians, applying pressure to the Allied flank. But Miles refuses to leave the high ground and engage. He likes his position, and he orders his marshals to sheathe their swords for now. Tony does mount his third attack against Karl's troops, who by now are getting a bit ground down with some losses. Napoleon has approved the release of the Young Guard from the reserve to shore up Karl's position before the third Austrian attack. And when that attack comes, it is ferocious. Tony throws everything he has into this. And in the swirling smoke and mayhem, Austrian cuirassiers smash through a Young Guard division, opening the first hole in the French line. 
but it's a short-lived moment of joy for Tony. Hope drains from the faces of the Allied commanders on turn six when the French bring up an entirely new corps from off-table. They have so many troops available, not all of their units can even fit on a six-foot by eight-foot tabletop. The Allies now accept reality. They have to call off this attack. How do you think the cas casualty ratio is going over there? Like Fucking the terrible. So we were losing more than they're losing. No blindfold, but a cigarette, please. <laughs> 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 All right, so you're saying about reforming, is it time for you to fall back and then us to decide to disengage at this point? I mean, because the thing that we did is sort of working in the fact that like the bulk of their army is not actually engaged with us. You know, so it's actually, we're probably at the best advantage that we can get by not engaging in the center on the flank because they are so much heavy. Like we've got a single line yeah. and they've got like three lines in most places. Um, but if you're not making gain there, and I know you guys are trying, it's not a criticism, but if you're not making gain, should we start talking about? Yes. You pull back, make it look like we're just, um, like you're just redressing the ranks so they don't understand that we're trying to retreat. In our campaign rules, ordering a premature withdrawal from a tabletop engagement allows your opponent to use his cavalry to pursue and inflict free attacks on your retreating army. The allies are unwilling to take those losses, and they decide they will try and hold on until nightfall, switching over to a defensive posture. All right, gentlemen, you're done. We have no shooting back. I think we attack now. Because there seems to be some guys in the black there that, uh... Oh, yeah. Permanently disordered. Two of them, right? Two of them. What the hell? So do they get stationary or do they get... No, 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 no Emperor, you did tell us that at some point in this battle you were going to start making bad choices. <laughs> yes, I, did. I did say and, that. And it is my job as family, as family, as family. <laughs> to just remind you of your words and then I will go back to Berlin. <laughs> Even now, late in the day, with the Allies clearly no longer pressing the attack, Miles hesitates to order a general advance. Yes, the battle is already won for the French, but a coordinated major effort could spell doom for the outnumbered, bloodied Allied army. But it's not until turn nine, just two turns from the end of the day, that the Emperor finally gives the nod to counterattack. Um, we get to re-roll any hits from that. <laughs> Oh, really? That's a yeah. Spaniard. Yeah. We hit on sixes. These are hot. These are the fuck. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, we got a hit. Nice. We got a hit. What'd you get, Ed? Two sixes and two fives. Oh, that's a five. It looks good. Okay, it looks good. Yeah, it's well, close Let's see. Both, uh, you know, you can shrug them off. We did. <laughs> so one hit and you're gone. Okay. With dusk fast approaching, Napoleon's marshals have too little time to deal the decisive knockout blow that was there for the taking hours earlier. Which begs the question, why the sudden bout of caution from our Napoleon with so much at stake? We're being a little gamey. Part, part volume being it is a rule set that benefits the defender uh, fairly significantly. And because there was no room to maneuver, any attack was going to be a frontal assault. I was actually very surprised the Allies attacked uh, in, in that game. You know, had we had an extra table and we had room to maneuver, we would have attacked. But doing anything frontal, you, 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 you get the math tells you, you get the result that we had in the game. You get three to one casualties. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, we just didn't have any room to move, so you got to charge ahead. And, and, and that rule set, that, that, that just doesn't work. So, I'm wearing these shades so you can't see my tears, but it did not go well today. No, we, we had a plan, thought we could get in, do some damage, retreat back into Prague. Uh, but as I whispered to Tony at one point, I said, well, now that we've 
now that we've bloodied his fist with our nose, <laughs> should, should we leave the field? <laughs> Dieter and I found ourselves in the untenable position, the Kobayashi Maru scenario. We have to fight him, but he outnumbers us, or we can run away, in which case he takes Prague. Either way, we're going to lose the campaign. Um, I, I believe we took the uh, we took the manly option, as it were. Um, we went toe to toe, and here we are crying into our drinks. The Battle of Prague is over, and the battered army of Bohemia limps back into the fortified city, having lost 28,000 men. The French lose just 11,000, making this a clear victory and one worth three victory points due to the size of the forces involved. You heard Tony and Dieter in the aftermath of the battle, rather downbeat, feeling that the fall campaign must surely now be lost. But the campaign for the liberation of Germany is a big theater of operations, and not everything is going Napoleon's way. In the north, Bernadotte is finally on the Oder, setting up a pontoon bridge crossing to bypass the French fortress of Kustrin. In Silesia, Chow has advanced as far as Bautzen, where he now faces a massive strategic decision. Should he move north to unite with Bernadotte, west to besiege Dresden, or south to try and relieve Prague? Chow decides that the army of Bohemia cannot be sacrificed. For the Allies to still win this campaign, those men cannot be trapped or left to die inside the walls of Prague. Chow turns 50,000 men south on an aggressive forced march. Of course, the French are hoping to reduce Prague before Blucher's arrival. Do we want to attack, gentlemen? I mean, yes. <laughs> right. Council of War, we're there. And that was your objective. Prague's the objective. Prague was the objective. Here it's we go. High or is low? Low, low, good. Low is good for us. Okay. Here we go, one to one. Three. Defender retreat. All right, first we're going to roll on the casualty table, and then they could modify those casualties, and it could also allow them to ignore a retreat. We each lose two strength points. All right, now you should roll on the fortified city table. Three. Three, you may ignore the defender retreat if you choose to do so for the five fortified points that are in there. I believe we're staying. The French assault nearly succeeds in taking the city, but 50,000 allied troops remain in the fortifications, desperately holding on. Despite their early string of successes, the wider strategic theater of operations looks increasingly ominous for the French. Most of their strength is stuck bloodying itself against the walls of Prague, ceding the strategic initiative to the Allies. And Ed and Chow are keen to capitalize. On turn six, Bernadotte liberates the deserted streets of Berlin. Dave and his screening force are long gone, by now nearly to Dresden. This was intended to be the assembly point for Napoleon's entire force, but while Dave has arrived as scheduled, his stepfather is nowhere to be found. On turn seven, another French assault is repulsed at Prague, and the Russian army of Poland arrives at Breslau with fresh reinforcements. But it's Blucher's much more immediate reinforcements that concern the French. Miles, Carl, and Simon huddle to discuss their options. They decide Ney will continue the siege, while Napoleon and Marat turn to hit Blucher. Chow deftly retreats skirting the French thrust. On turn eight, another well-timed force march by Chow finally brings him within supporting distance of Prague, assembling nearly a quarter million allied men. They are now at near parity with Napoleon in this region, and because the board game rules favor attacking, the allies are going to do just that. They attack. Uh, we can roll a die and we can be humiliated in 10 seconds. It take <laughs> well, two hours. we're deciding the fate of this campaign one way or another. Right. So, Because uh, I think at this point, it's three point difference would uh, be enough. Um, so at 200 to 270, 
I mean, we always have to round down or? Yeah. So it's one to two still, even with a combined might mm -hmm. of three different nationalities. Well, it's, so, a language, it's a language problem. So uh, we have it. to roll extremely low here. And if four is not extremely low, not particularly, no. That is a in question mark result, which means that it is inconclusive, but I must still roll the die. We both lose two. two. The second battle of Prague is inconclusive, and it doesn't take long for command friction to rear its head in the Allied ranks. Tony feels Prague must be held. Chow feels freedom of maneuver is more important, and Dieter is stuck in the middle, unwilling to leave his command isolated. In the end, he chooses to stay hunkered down with the Austrians behind the walls of Prague. They've held this long, so perhaps they'll hold a bit longer. And Prague does hold longer. Well, for one turn anyway. A third French assault drives the Allies out of the city with heavy losses. It's a demoralizing blow to the coalition, and five more victory points for the French. Napoleon's triumph in Bohemia does lose a little of its luster if you look to the north, where Ed's steady, workmanlike performance is getting harder to ignore. Magdeburg, one of the key French supply depots on the Elbe, fell to Ed last turn, leaving Leipzig, yes, that Leipzig, as the last major French supply center in the theater. Napoleon must hold Leipzig, or his armies could be out of supply, which is pretty important in the board game rules. I like how Campaign of Nations deals with logistics. It's a light-touch approach with no record-keeping. The bottom line is that if you're cut off from any supply source, your armies in the field do not recover as well from disruption. That's a major loss of combat effectiveness, which halves your strength in any future combats. So Napoleon cannot afford to lose Leipzig. The victory points are almost immaterial. It's the loss of supply that could be crippling. Ed is well versed on the rules of the game and is already counting out the hexes to find the shortest possible route for Bernadotte's army to take. The most direct path on turn 9 would be through Wittenberg, but Dave has learned his lesson about abandoning fortresses from his spring embarrassment and detached a covering force during his march to Dresden. Storming the fortress could take Ed several turns. Establishing a pontoon bridge across the Elba would also take at least two turns. There is another route Ed has been busy calculating. The road through Torgau runs directly to Leipzig, but you'll notice the flag at Torgau doesn't match any of the other flag symbols on our map. That's the flag of the Kingdom of Saxony. You didn't think we forgot about the Saxons, did you? They haven't played much of a role in our campaign yet, but suddenly, in turn 9 of the fall, the Saxons are in the spotlight. Historically, Saxony was a staunch ally of Napoleon, but famously flipped on him in October 1813. There is an abstract mechanic in Campaign of Nations for Saxon defection, but in our version of history today, the Saxons are rock solid in their commitment to France. If you want to know why, you'll need to go back and listen to the complete Summer Truce Talks, which are available for free as a podcast. But the short version is that I, yours truly, may have screwed the pooch on this one. Fearing that Miles was making a rather persuasive case to our guest historians for a several-turn Austrian delay into the war, I felt compelled to offer the Austrians something tangible for their loyalty. And so, in the podcast negotiation, I offered the Habsburgs a chunk of southern Saxony. My offer was very well received, but it did have the unintended consequence of ruffling Saxon feathers. And so, in our campaign, we've determined the Saxons are not keen to have their kingdom ripped apart, and they've chosen to stay completely loyal to Napoleon. The Saxons have been a non-factor in the fall, until right now, because on turn 9, a Saxon corps is sitting on Torgau, blocking a direct path to Leipzig. 
Ed decides that he must split Bernadotte's army into multiple columns, locking down the French and Saxon garrisons while he takes the long way through Magdeburg. There will be no easy shortcut to Leipzig. It's a clear threat to Napoleon's last logistical hub, but a threat our French players won't have to deal with today, because by turn 10, they've accumulated enough victory points in the board game to claim a convincing operational victory. The French hold Prague, Dresden, Leipzig for now, and have won every field battle in the spring and fall. It's a far better outcome for Napoleon than the historical 1813 result. But how much better? Because if we look beyond the limited confines of our board game, strategically, Napoleon will have little choice but to turn back and secure his supply lines to France before the onset of winter, rather than pursue the Allied armies around him. And when we shared the results of our fall campaign with Napoleonic historians Alexander Mikaberdze and Zach White, they were unconvinced that French success in Bohemia would have been enough to change history and save Napoleon's empire. I think the coalition will endure, knowing full well that Wellington is doing very well. Battle of Vittoria has been uh, uh, fought already. British troops are on the way to the Pyrenees, and, and that cannot but encourage the coalition to fight, uh, to fight for another day. Success that Napoleon had on tactically, right? I still see him losing strategically uh, in, in this campaign, just as he did in, in actual history. Within the context of the scenario that you've created here, Berlin's been reoccupied. So suddenly Prussian morale begins to recover. There's a greater inclination amongst the German states to really seriously reconsider their position. And we've alluded to it already. Napoleon's not really in an ideal situation come the final turn because in a real world situation all you've got to do is strike for Leipzig and if you can cut Napoleon's lines of communications I almost feel like this is 1812 all over again what we've created here in that sense that Napoleon is a bit too far away from safety and from home and the winter is now setting in. If you want to hear the complete post-game analysis from our expert historians, that fascinating 90-minute chat is available for free right now on Little Wars FM, anywhere you listen to podcasts. We'll have an Apple Podcast link in the video description. Alex and Zach talk about the historical outcome of 1813, as well as contextualizing the outcome of our war game. Well, gentlemen, as much as it pains me to say this, to the French. To oui. the French. Vive la France. Je n'aime pas, je déteste. It was a great game with great people, and most importantly, we've saved someone from the clutches of Mark's game room. And I think, Greg, <laughs> we can drink to that. To, to Carl, to yeah. Carl. To Carl. To Carl. Uh, you know, I think playing this game multiplayer really adds something to the classic Hex Encounter okay. game feel because you could feel the command and control restrictions but just ever arguing with each other the whole time, which really I felt was a good simulation of the coalition's disarray. I, I, <laughs> I think one thing that we did that enhanced the game was the fog of war. The flags. Yeah, the yeah. flags yeah. and not knowing the strength. I think that, you know, especially in the first few turns where you just don't know where people are. Well, we knew where you were pretty quick, <laughs> let me tell you. 300,000 French coming down the Prague. I was not subtle. As we close the book on Season 4 of Little Wars TV, let's give you a shot to win some free wargaming goodness. We have a copy of Campaign of Nations by Hollenspiel, the outstanding Hex Encounter game we used throughout our 1813 series. Also, we have two brand new 10mm army packs from the Wargaming Company. They're offering you guys a shot to win a free French and a free Russian army to start your own Napoleonic campaigns. All you have to do is leave a comment on this video and let us know your favorite episode from this season of Little Wars TV. You have nine episodes to consider, and we'd love to know which one you love the most. Next week, we'll pick three random comments, and those lucky winners will get our awesome prizes. Thanks again for watching the channel. All our viewers out there, thank you for your support all these years. We'll see you at a convention soon.
Viva la France! <laughs> what, what he said. <laughs> Wait, guys drinking? <laughs> yes, game with you. Don't shake hands with that nefarious Frenchie. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs>